This morning's scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Now, I enjoy the Gospel of John because it's slightly different than the other three Gospels. I look at it more as a memoir of one of Jesus' longtime disciples as he looks back on his life and the ministry of Jesus. So sometimes it reads a bit differently, but it's his personal memories of Jesus' life. And he says in this passage, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do as I command. I will no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love one another. May God add his blessing and understanding to the reading of his holy word. Way back in the 1990s, when I first got involved in association work through TABCOM, I was part of the Old Colony Baptist Association. And at one of my first meetings, I met two men, Ken and Jim. In fact, when I was asked to be clerk of the association in the mid-90s, it was these two men who approached me. And over the years, I would see Jim and Ken time and again at various board meetings and association gatherings. It was obvious that they had known each other for a very long time. They had both been involved in both the association and their church for many, many years. And you never saw one without the other. They sat at board meetings together. They volunteered for the same assignments. Now, have you ever seen the Muppets TV show? And in that show, there's these two old guys that are sitting in the balcony. That That was Ken and Jim. They reminded me so much of those old guys. They had this wonderful shared friendship, which was obvious to everyone they saw, and they also had a sense of humor. I went to visit their church in Hanson, where they both attended, for a meeting and to take a photograph of the board of directors. How hard would that be? Get your old colony board together, stand up, take a picture, and leave. No, they made it a fun-filled day. There was nothing they would not do to get a laugh. They had laughable one-upmanship all during the meeting, and during the photo session, they mugged for the cameras, stood in front of each other, covered each other's mouths, just like kids. But there was a friendship there that is solid. They would do anything for each other. When Ken had a heart attack, Jim was there helping out his friend, visiting regularly, talking on the phone. When Jim's daughter died of cancer, Ken was there for his friend, offering comfort and support. We've all seen this type of friendship, and it's a rare and beautiful thing. I laugh when people tell me they have hundreds of friends, dozens. Now, according to Facebook, I have over 500 friends. Only a couple of them, though, are truly friends. The rest are classmates, other pastors, work acquaintances. But friends, well, maybe one or two. There are friends, and then there are chums, buddies, college roommates, family. And there are the fair-weather friends who hang around as long as the sun is shining and there's no hardship. We almost cheapened the value of the word friendship by applying the word to every single person we come in contact with. But real friends are those who show up and stay with us when we are facing trying circumstances. And they stay with us when there is nothing to do but wait. Those are the rare ones. Those are the real friends. Defining what friendship means is something that's been written about, sung about, 
something people have written poetically about since the beginning of time. The Buddha said that a friend is the one who guards you when you are not on your guard and does not forsake you in trouble. He even lays down his life for your sake. He restrains you from doing wrong. He enjoins you to do right. He reveals to you the way to heaven. The book of Ecclesiastes speaks of friendship. It says two are better than one because they have good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. And I always loved this little one. It was at a pizza shop on the billboard. And it said, friends are the bacon bits and the salad of life. <laughs> True friends will give and give and give. Sometimes their very life. True friends are frank and honest. They do not hesitate to open their heart and their mind to you without shyness or secretiveness. True friends trust and risk. You never doubt their loyalty. But there is one friendship in our life that we need to tend to. The one we neglect time and again, almost cruelly. And that is our friendship with Jesus. Not Jesus' friendship with us, but ours with Jesus. We are Jesus' friends. He says so in the passage I read today. He says, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus has opened every ounce of his being to us. Can we say the same? Have we opened every ounce of our being to him? Frankly, I think we do a very poor job of being his friends. I think we have a tendency to view our relationship with Jesus as pretty much one-sided. And Jesus is the one doing all the giving. One of the very familiar images of Jesus is that of a bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. But there's another person in this relationship. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, John writes, The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him is as filled with joy when he hears the bridegroom, bridegroom's first voice. We are the friend. We, right here in the pews, we are that friend. The person without whom the marriage cannot be solemnized. There can't be a church without people, without the friends. It's important. It's a very important role. And then we fail at it time and again. On Sunday morning, we gather for worship. And you sit here in your pews, and you hear the door open and shut. Well, you hear footsteps, and you hear a familiar voice, and you rejoice. Oh, there's so-and-so. They're here. Oh, it's so nice. Usually you can tell who has come before you see them just by their voice or their footsteps. Just as we listen for our friends, we should be listening for Jesus at our door. We are the ones who should be filled with joy when we hear his voice. But instead, when Jesus calls us, we deny it, we ignore it, we refuse to even pay attention. Some friend we are. Look at Jesus' life and ministry. He could very easily have ended up lonely and isolated. It happens, we see it a lot, when people who become very famous and become very puffed up and they're surrounded by people who only tell them, yes, not true friends, just hanger-oners. They leave their old friends behind leaving nothing but bobblehead people with them who will keep saying, yeah, that's good, that's great, that's good. You want to go rob a bank? That's fine. Yeah, that's good. But Jesus was genuine in his relationship. Jesus chose to be with humanity in all its grittiness, all of our, oh, our miserable getting along with other people, our way of life. He chose to be there in the midst of all that. He didn't lose sight of the humbleness. Even more, even as more and more people heard about Jesus and the word spread that this is an incredible man, you've got to come hear him. 
he remained humble. He chose fishermen to be part of his life, not temple leaders, not wealthy patrons who could underwrite the cost of his ministry. He chose to speak to everyday common people, and he lived among them. He lived in the fishing village of Capernaum with the peasants, not in the palaces of Jerusalem. And he chose us to be his friends. We come from a long line of bad friends of Jesus. And Jesus' disciples didn't fully appreciate his act of generosity on his part. How did they repay his friendship? After the Last Supper, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he was praying, what did his friends do? They fell asleep. Just when he needed his friends the most. At that time in his life where everything was right there in front of him, his future was going to be very short. They weren't there. Think about it. He's in this hour of need, and he's probably very nervous, talking to God, asking if there's another way out. And where are his friends? They're asleep. At the end on the cross, he gave the ultimate gift of friendship just by being on that cross. He put his life on the line for us. He died for us so that we could live forever ever with God. Jesus was up there alone on the cross, no friends. In fact, his very closest friends had turned their backs on him, and they denied they even knew him. Jesus gave him everything, and we didn't give him anything. We gave him up. Jesus had told his disciples, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. And at this critical time in Jesus' life, he takes the time to put aside his own concerns, his own fears, and reaches out in friendship. This passage from the Gospel of John takes place during Holy Week. In fact, upon reading closely, it appears that this took place at the Last Supper that Jesus is with his disciples for the last time, and he calls them his friends. John is slightly different from the other Gospels in his telling of the events of Holy Week. As I said, it's more of a memoir of one of his disciples. So in this passage from John, Jesus makes this important shift in his relationship with his disciples. It's, very, it's a very important shift. He is no longer their teacher. They are no longer just followers. Jesus now calls his disciples friends. He has elevated their status. He is now sharing with them openly, honestly, willing to risk everything. Jesus shares his deepest thoughts with them. They are no longer servants, waiting on him, doing his bidding. They are now his friends. And this friendship parallel goes back to the Old Testament. The concept of being friends with God leads directly back to God's relationship with both Abraham and Moses. Abraham and Moses are both called friends of God. But nowhere else in the Bible is that particular term used. Friends of God. But now Jesus is elevating us to that same status in a relationship with God through him. It speaks of the highest possible relationship between God and a human being. We should be thrilled. But on a regular basis, we ignore this friendship. We don't cultivate it. We don't pay attention to it. We toss it aside as if it is nothing. Or we take it for granted. Now after this elevation of the disciples to friends of Jesus, there's a series of three prayers that Jesus prays. One for himself, one for his friends, and then one for the followers. There's not even a whimper of an indication that these newly named friends return the favor. Jesus has now opened himself up completely, prayed for his friends, and what does he get in return? Silence. Nothing. In fact, 
the very next event in the Gospel of John is the arrest of Jesus. We sang this great hymn this morning, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But what does it say? All our hopes and needs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Leave it to Jesus. He'll take care of it. True, he will. But isn't friendship a two-way street? Shouldn't we be doing some of the giving? I have pretty much emphasized how badly we have treated our friendship with Jesus. Maybe we just don't know how to be friends with Jesus. So what should we be doing to be a friend of Jesus? My daughter has a t-shirt that has the words, Jesus is my homeboy, blazoned across the front of it. It's a nice sentiment, but I think we really need to dig much deeper than a slogan on a t-shirt. I spoke previously of the attributes of a true friend, but let me repeat. Real friends are those who show up and stay with us when we are facing trying circumstances. And they stay with us when there is nothing to do but wait. These are the rare ones. So let us look at each part, different part of the definitions. We need to make the effort to show up. Real friends are those who show up. We can't leave Jesus between the covers of our Bible as it sits on the shelf at home. We need to learn about what Jesus is telling us. We need to study our Bible. We need to show up at church. We need to spend time in prayer. And we need to stay with Jesus, not just run for the hills. Real friends are those who stay with us. They don't drop out or stay away when we hit the hard times. So we need to do the same. Stay there. Stay there with Jesus. When people are slamming our faith, poking fun at our beliefs, laughing at us for going to church on Sunday, for being part of a community of faith, how many of us even tell our friends that we go to church, that it's an important part of our life? We need to keep our commitment to Jesus, to stay part of a community of believers, not wander off when the going gets tough. Allow, don't allow ourselves to drift away when things aren't exactly how we want them. Because, you know, it's not our place, it's God's place, not ours. We need to wait and listen. We all need to stay around, speak out when some segment of society is facing trying circumstances. Speak up when we see wrongs. Speak out against injustice. We need to be proactive in living out our faith. Speak out against human trafficking, the situation of homelessness in our country, the inequities in our economic situation, and the list goes on and on. What are we speaking out about? How are we living out our faith beyond the doors of this church? We need to be there when there is nothing to do but wait. Real friends are sometimes just there, just present with us. And there's a peace and tranquility that is found in that presence. Have you ever been in a really bad place in your life where bad things are happening and you didn't want words, you just didn't want to hear anybody say anything else? but you wanted somebody there. Somebody could just hold your hand, pat you on the shoulder, be there with you to go through those times. Because there is a peace and a tranquility, as I said, found in just being present with someone. We need to stay the course. We need to sometimes just sit and wait. We need to wait for God to speak with us. I learned this very clearly while I was working as a hospice chaplain, which is a ministry of presence. Being present in those sacred moments of transition in someone's life. It was learning pastoral care, not pastoral cure. I couldn't cure any of the medical situations going on. I couldn't prevent a death from occurring, but I could be there with them as they walked the path in front of them. Be present with them. And in the same way, we need to be present with our faith. We need to let our faith wash over us and become part of our life. In all of this, there is a caution. We have to be careful of being too comfortable with our friends. 
They are familiar parts of our lives, and we have a shared history. We have loved together, we have laughed together, we have cried together. Sometimes, though, this can turn, it can turn into a very insular society of its own. We have all we need. We don't need anybody else in. We don't let anyone else in. We don't need them. But be careful. Be open. Don't get too comfortable in our friendships that we keep ourselves closed off from new possibilities, new friendships. Jesus sends people into our lives. We need to be open to them because you know they are Jesus in our lives. And we need to be that friend to them, just as we have to be a friend to Jesus. And I'm sure that each of us remembers those cliques from high school, you know, the cheerleaders, the athletes, the rich ones, the musical ones, and they all stuck together, almost afraid to go outside of their little groups, afraid of what people might think or say if they became friends with, well, a nerd or a math geek. They were closed off to the possibilities. And I have seen churches with cliques, cliques of old timers, cliques of new timers, because the old timers won't let them in, choir cliques that come to blows over music. And all Jesus asks us for is obedience, to obey his command. And what was his command? To love one another. His love for us was enormous. His love for us gives us eternal life. His love for us also gives us the opportunity and the responsibility to return the favor, return the gift of his friendship with our devotion, our loyalty, our obedience, and our presence in this community of faith. It is the very least that we owe him. So let us strive to be a good friend to Jesus. Amen.